Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Since the beginning of the legislative session and long before that, it's been clear that housing must be a top priority because it's part of the solution to the many challenges we face. You've all heard me talk about the numbers and how we need to build thousands of units a year just to meet demand. As you know, over the last few years, we've invested hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars in housing. And what we've learned is that money alone isn't solving the problem. And we also know we need more investment from the private sector. It's clear the most impactful way to get results is to make it easier, faster, and less expensive to build and restore the housing we desperately need. Despite legislative leaders agreeing we're in a housing crisis and that housing is a priority, the House chose to instead pass a conservation bill, H-687, which, as it stands, would expand regulation, making it harder for communities, many communities, to build the housing they need. On the other hand, the Senate Economic Development Committee, way back in February, passed a very strong housing bill, S-311, which over the last two months has been stuck in that Senate Natural Resources because they didn't have time due to their work on battery recycling and the Fish and Wildlife Board. Over a month ago, I told you what I thought they were doing. I said they were going to take the House, the house version of the, um, the conservation bill, H-687, throw a few pieces of S-311 into it, and call it a housing bill. I was hoping I'd be wrong, but unfortunately, it looks as though that's exactly what they're doing and what they were going to do. Last night, my team once again went into Senate Natural and asked they pass 311 as a standalone bill because it has broad bipartisan, tripartisan support and took a lot of work to come together. My guess is they came and, uh, to the political calculation conclusion and we'll keep them together because that's the only way they can get their Act 250 expansion bill passed. If that's the case and they insist on a merger, I will only accept it if it actually moves us toward our goal to build and repair the units we need, which means adding all the reforms and tax incentives from 311, coupled with substantial changes to the House's version of 687, which again will expand Act 250 and limit growth throughout Vermont. Failure to make the changes needed to give all our communities a chance to thrive would be a failure to meet the moment and a failure to deliver on an issue I think we can all agree is a top priority for all our constituents. It should be a surprise to no one that I will not accept any bill that makes it harder slower or more expensive to build housing because we need to do the exact opposite. But it shouldn't come to that because almost every lawmaker in office today began their campaigns promising to address housing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Curley to talk through her testimony last night. Thank you, Governor Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Vermont is in the throes of a housing crisis. The dearth of housing in Vermont touches everything and affects all of us. The lack of housing available across the economic spectrum is our greatest barrier to affordability, growing the economy, and creating safe communities where all Vermonters can thrive. Earlier this week, I saw a presentation by VHFA that showed only 6% of renters in Vermont could afford a median priced home. That is alarming. It should alarm all of us. The dream of home ownership is slipping away from too many of Vermonters. All Vermonters need more housing options for renting and buying. We need them for young people just getting their start, families with kids who attend our schools, older people who are looking to downsize, individuals and families experiencing homelessness, as well as people who want to move here and share the Vermont experience with us. 
It is our obligation as leaders to increase Vermont's housing stock for all Vermonters. Part of what's driving our housing crisis is the added time and expense required to navigate Vermont's current, current permitting process under Act 250, driving up costs for renters and buyers, as well as taxpayers who contribute to affordable housing efforts. Another crucial element we can't ignore is the fact that demand for housing is outstripping our supply. Vermont has some of the oldest housing stock in the nation. Every year, hundreds of homes fall into disrepair and out of our housing stock. Current estimates show that we need to add roughly 6,800 homes and apartments now just to get to a healthy housing market. So my team is doing everything it can to get more units online. Vermont did not get into this housing crisis overnight. It took decades of underbuilding. And none of us know exactly what the silver bullet is, but there is undeniable evidence that modernizing zoning and land use regulations, reforming the appeals process, increasing tax incentives, and making targeted investments all combined will move the needle. And I've said repeatedly, just like the governor, we cannot buy our way out of this, meaning we cannot solve this housing crisis solely with state money and programmatic investments. As I told the Senate Natural Resources Committee last night, it has always been the administration's position that we need a housing bill that addresses the immediate housing needs of Vermonters. The moment requires legislation that will help jumpstart the creation of new units in addition to rehabbing others that have fallen into disrepair and offline. Don't get me wrong, Act 250 needs updating. It's 50 years old and should reflect the needs of our time. Permitting and appeals are an important part of the process, but overhauling Act 250 is a massive undertaking. As currently drafted by the House, modernizing Act 250 would require a significant on-ramp, time and investment. It would take years to build and even longer to get off the ground. We can't wait years. If we don't act now, it will exacerbate our housing crisis, the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. I understand the likelihood of getting two separate bills is slim, but I want to be clear that the administration wants a comprehensive housing bill like S311, we'd like it to contain the following. The adoption of immediate interim Act 250 exemptions for housing built in designated downtowns and village centers and areas with municipal water and wastewater. Build on the HOME Act passed last year where it, with increased housing density by making it clear that those density requirements are for places with water and sewer. We also want to update parking bylaws. Update Act 250, uh, I'm sorry, Act 250 appeals should stay in the environmental court and not be redirected to a separate land use review board. We should also add another environmental judge to speed up the review of housing appeals. Change the appeals process to require higher threshold for participation. Right now, any 10 individuals from a municipality regardless of their standing in a project, can file an appeal. S311 includes a provision to raise that bar to a more reasonable threshold. Limiting appeals in areas planned for growth in dense housing as long as they meet the planning goals of their community. A freeze on property tax valuations on blighted properties to incentivize the rehabilitation of these properties into permanent housing. And rather than the state collecting the property transfer tax on blighted structures being rehabilitated or converting into housing, which will allow buyers to use that money to fix up those properties. We firmly believe that we can preserve the beauty of our state while also encouraging growth in the areas where we want it. We can protect our rural working lands and key natural resources while supporting the rehabilitation of blighted housing stock and adding new housing units. So I want to echo the governor and say to those lawmakers who want to boost our housing stock, please help us seize this moment. With that, I'll turn it back over to the governor.
Thank you very much, Secretary Curley. Now I'll open up to questions. Uh, Senate Naturals moved forward with merging these bills. They included, you know, many of the provisions in 311, interim exemptions, uh, all the tax incentives, things like that. So why is it important to you to keep these bills separate? Well, first of all, I don't know as they passed it out. Maybe you've seen something that They're they- They plan to pass it out later today. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Sure. Um, I'd like to see what's in it first before commenting fully. Um, but I've, what I've seen over the last 24 hours is actually moving in the wrong direction, moving backwards, making it um, 687 even more difficult. So unless they have all the changes we want, S311 is really important to be in there. It had unanimous support in Senate Economic Development. Uh, it deserves to have the full Senate at least weigh in on this. And uh, for them just to piecemeal it, just add small pieces here and there. I don't think it's fair to the body. It's not fair to Vermonters. It's the only housing bill that is viable that I've seen uh, moving through this, uh, this legislative process. So I just think they should be separated, but if they're not and they're merged, it's going to take the whole thing as well as um, some changes to 687. Can you be specific about the sticking points? for you in, in 687? Well, there are numerous, and again, um, I'm not sure what they've done thus far, uh, but, um, but it's, first of all, and I'm gonna let Secretary Moore weigh in on this, but um, it's just taking, it's taking too long. It's over a long period of time. We need immediate relief now if we wanna get, uh, address this housing crisis. So uh, that's one area, and it just puts more restrictions on everyone throughout Vermont. Uh, and I know that they, they claim, you know, 1A will give exemptions to many communities, but only the big ones, not, uh, not the rural communities that need, need our help. So with that, Secretary Moore, can you um, describe some of the other challenges? Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Governor. I think, you know, they, there are a number of places where, frankly, it, it complicates um, some already existing challenging processes. For example, it, it separates or bifurcates the appeals process and would have Act 250 appeals heard by the Land Use Review Board, um, where the our permits would continue to go straight to the e-court. Um, it actually repeals deference to a &R technical determinations, which to my mind creates a, a significant amount of regulatory uncertainty uh, for anyone who is subject to, to a &R oversight. Um, it requires jur any jurisdiction interested in that tier 1A designation to have wildlife planning bylaws. And it is my understanding that no Vermont communities currently have those in place. Uh, so there are a number of places, and that, that may just be a starting set, but where, where there are either additional requirements, changes in process uh, that actually further complicate rather than streamline and simplify our existing regulatory system. Sure. Um, uh, just to clarify, too, the interim exemptions that were added into this from uh, what was uh, intended in 311, this is very different than what was in 311. 311 was much broader in their interim exemptions, and I think more akin to what we would need over the next uh, several years while we're laying out the land use mapping and gearing up with the new tiers. And so to scale way back on that and then put in very modest interim exemptions does not meet the need of what we were advocating for nor what was seen in 311. Uh, one more, if I may. If this merged version of 687 continues to advance, do you expect to veto it? Well, it depends on what's in it. And again, if they, uh, if they will include all of uh, S311, and, uh, and accept the changes we uh, see are necessary in 687, uh, then maybe not. But as it stands right now, from what I've seen, um, it would very likely uh, reach a V deal. But we'll see, we'll see what happens. Governor, Long ways to go. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if, if there were um, exemptions for smaller towns, Barton, uh, Hardwick, et cetera. What's your confidence level that developers would actually build there? I mean, isn't the demand in Shitley County, Franklin County? Yeah, again, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the smaller communities, um, but I'm also concerned about, you know, S311 also had some tax incentives in there for developers, uh, whether they continue to keep those in, and, and that's why it's so important to take 
all of S311. Make sure that's uh, the body of the legislation. And again, it would be much easier, simpler, um, and, and give us a fast results if they just separated the two and uh, took them up uh, at, at different times and had the body weigh in on them. Because I, I would suspect, again, based on everything I saw in the, in the last election, with everyone pretty much universally saying we have a housing crisis on our hands and we need to fix it. 687 passed, I think, the House with 89 votes, which is not enough to survive a, a, a veto. Um, should it come to that point, I mean, I guess, what is your, your confidence level that something can get across the finish line this year? <clears throat> I think it could go either way. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't want to move us in the wrong direction. Uh, we need immediate help, and if this doesn't provide it, then you know we'll just have to soldier on. But um, but from the House version, and again, from what I understand and what I've seen, this is evolving in the wrong direction. 687 was bad enough, I think, coming over from the House, and now they're making it worse. So we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe some of those same House members that were supportive of 687 may say today with whatever comes out of a conference committee or whatever comes out of the Senate, they may say, I'm not supportive anymore. Especially when they figure out that it doesn't really help their small towns. Governor, sort of a blunt question. Um, do you think that H87 shows more concern about bear habitat and land conservation than about building new homes? 687, you mean? Yes. Uh, um, I, yeah, I, would, I, I don't know if I would characterize it like that. Um, I think there is a measured approach, and they're looking at the, the big picture, the long picture, and, uh, and they're trying to include everything in it. And, and that's exactly my point, that we need relief now. And uh, this really doesn't do it. 687 is something that's going to evolve over a number of years. So. Again, pitting one against the other, I think they can, you can have both, but, but not, in this, uh, not in this time frame, not here, not now. Developers I've spoken with this could be pretty three of you say it's very frustrating when they run into these appeals because it can take anywhere up to 18 months in environmental court to get figured out. And they said they don't necessarily know if this new board's going to work, but it's something different than what they're dealing with right now, which is super frustrating. So I guess what would be your kind of your response to that with them saying? Well again, let's boards? let's discuss that. I mean that's a that's a minor portion of this. Um, although it's it's important to some. We are adding an environmental judge. Uh, that will help the process as well. So, but don't mind discussing some of those issues. Um, obviously, we want uh, developers to develop, and uh, because most of the housing is built by private entities, not by government. So we need to to work with them to make sure that we're we're doing everything we can to help. Secretary Moore, is there anything you want to add to the? I don't know if you heard the question or not. Sorry, um, Deputy Secretary uh, Tate Brooks for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Just want to touch base in regards to your question about appeals. I think it's also important to realize that over 20 years ago, there was a board that heard appeals um, and appeals for municipal permits and our permits, Act 250 permits, went in all different places. And one could probably imagine, speaking with uh, somebody who is building homes out there, oftentimes they'll need to get a local permit, an a &R permit, and if it's gonna trigger Act 250, an Act 250 permit. So what we're seeing here within H687, and certainly being uh, discussed and debated uh, down in the Senate House Natural Resources Committee, is that by splitting off the appeals, the Act 250 appeals separately, pulling them out of the environmental court and putting them to a separate body, now you have somebody who's trying to build a home who not only needs to uh, get approved 
uh, and get sign off from the environmental court, you're now going to have to have a whole separate entity also in agreement. So it kind of provides an opportunity for opponents of housing two opportunities to kind of shut down those projects. Governor, the Ways and Means Committee is set to advance the yield bill. Um, it has a few tax hikes in it. I know you said you opposed, but uh, it sets up a study, really, to, to look at the future of, of education funding and financing. What, what's your read on, on the yield bill right now? Typical legislative reaction. Don't want to address the issue right now. And we're going to put a study. We're going to we're going to study it. Meanwhile, Vermonters are going to be impacted by up to a 20% increase in their property taxes that they can't afford. And I think uh, I think again, raising taxes uh, isn't something that we should be doing especially these days and, and with everything that I've seen on the other side of the, uh, the aisle there, um, this is uh, concerning. So we've known about this since December and I think we, um, we have to be creative. Uh, we have to think about our constituents, Vermonters, the real impact this will have on their everyday lives. So I would advocate that we do something now, not study this. Let's do something to fix it. State Treasurer said the proposal that you and Commissioner Gallego <coughs> brought forward to essentially have it in payments over time um, said that that could have a big concern, a big, big effect on the state's credit rating. I mean, have you have you seen that? Have you thought about that? And well, what else alternative yeah. could there be? Obviously, I've been concerned about that uh, throughout my legislative career as as chair of the Institutions Committee when I was in the Senate as uh, Lieutenant Governor and now as governor. Our credit rating is very important. But having said all that, I'd like to see the numbers uh, as well, because here, and the, the word you used was could. Um, could. Uh, the rating agencies haven't weighed in on this. Uh, we, they might suspect that they, they would look unfavorably at this, but if there was a plan in place to reduce costs in conjunction with this deferment, it, it could work. So I'm, uh, I know what the impact will be on Vermonters. I'm confident this will have an adverse impact on every single Vermonter here because of this education spending bill. And I don't know what the, agent, uh, the rating agencies will do with it. But again, I know what it will do to Vermonters. So I'm going to be on the side of Vermonters on this one. Isn't the time? They don't have all the. That's not what they do. Um, we will be meeting with them uh, as we typically do on a yearly basis, um, but and that will probably come up. But um, they're never going. They're not going to give you uh, their opinion at this point in time. They want to see all the numbers. They want to see everything that we've done or not doing, uh, and then they'll arrive at their conclusion independently of one another. So. That's just not how it works. So are you still suggesting that, would you still recommend that legislators move forward with the proposal put out on Friday despite this concern raised by the I'm saying we need to get creative. Um, if, if, if we ignore this, we don't at least contemplate this, we know what the impact's going to be. It's going to affect. Every single person in this room in a negative way and all across Vermont. So we know that. So we better do some, I think we should do something about it now. What we could, the treasurer could do is tell us what the, um, if, 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 and that's a big if, if the, the bonding uh, agencies decided to downgrade our credit rating, what's the effect? How much will that cost us? And then weigh it out about from in, in, in relationship to what we know is going to impact the $200 million is going to impact Vermonters versus what is the, what is the negative effect on Vermont? So are you saying that you think a, a downgraded, a potential downgraded credit rating might be worth it to I don't, reduce property 
I, I'd like to see. I'd like to see the analysis. I think we have to weigh that out. I'm sorry. But your administration hasn't asked for that analysis. Uh, we have not. I, I, I didn't know that the treasurer was going to come out and oppose it. So I don't think there's been enough time. But that's something that maybe he could forward. Did you talk to the treasurer? I didn't talk. Have? I didn't talk to him personally. But we've had conversations with him. Is there any leadership happening on cutting school spending, either from the administration or the legislature or the advocacy groups? Because I looked at Spalding has an IT director, just a supervisory union as an IT director, and five separate IT people in the supervisory level, and each school has its own. I just wonder, are we kind of talking? Well, there's no doubt. Um, you know. We have local control in the state. Uh, they're going to do what they need to do. The school boards have worked really hard uh, to put budgets together. I think uh, there was another, what, seven that went down yesterday? Six. Six went down yesterday. Um, so there, some, some are getting there, um, and it is having a, a positive effect on, on uh, lowering uh, the, the burden on Vermonters. I think it went from 240 now down to maybe 200. So that's, that's working, um, but it's not, it's not gonna get us far enough. So if there are measures that we put into place, we uh, being uh, legislatively, uh, that have a negative effect on the, the, the costs or, or have increased costs on uh, school districts, uh, we should, we should be looking at that. And I know they did. We, we worked with a group um, over the last month or so and uh, with our folks at the tax department and uh, came up with all kinds of ideas, ideas that we had contemplated over the last eight years and brought forward and uh, wasn't, they weren't well received at the time, but they, they're looking better, I think, to legislators at this point in time and they want to study them. That's a step in the right direction, but I'd say, you know, we need immediate relief. We need it now, and um, we don't need to continue to study this. We better do something. So, if there's something that we've done, like universal school meals, if it's something like that that we did, that cost thirty million dollars, then maybe we should take a look at that. Governor, I remember in 2022, everyone was running on housing. You mentioned that people were saying we need to build more housing. We we must do this. And I guess maybe you could explain a little bit to us, but what happens to everyone saying that when they're running for office? But then when they get into this building, it seems that the whole thing changes. Where, where does that go from we need to build more housing, but then we're now still talking about the housing we need to build and nobody wants to do anything? Yeah, I'm as mystified as you are. I have no idea. Is it ideologically driven? I, hard to say. I, you know, I would ask them individually. And again, these are based in some of the committees as well. So S311, something that would have a positive effect on housing in Vermont, something that we need, sorely need, um, was passed in a bipartisan fashion in the Senate Economic Development Committee, unanimous. So that's good news. And then it got stuck in Senate Natural, and I believe for political reasons, trying to marry it up with another bill that's not as palatable in hopes that they can get a little bit of both. So is it ideological? Maybe. Um, but, um, but I don't know as all legislators have had an opportunity to weigh in on this yet. So until they have a bill to work with, that's actually viable, then I, I don't know as we can cast judgment on them individually. Thank you all. Oh wait, did you have something on, somebody on Teams? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hate to have to do his job for him. <laughs> Uh, we'll go to Kevin, seven days. I'm, 
I may regret this, Kevin, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I saw you unmute for a second, Kev, but it looks like you're re-muted. There you go. How about now? Gotcha. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks, Governor. I appreciate it. So, uh, I hope you don't regret uh, taking my call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, I will ask you a tough question here because you said that H687 would uh, it is problematic for you because you felt it would limit growth and it would make it harder and slower and more expensive to build. And my question is, if you're going to make it cheaper and faster and less expensive to build in the areas where we want development to happen, what is so bad about limiting growth making it harder to build, slower to build, and more expensive to build in areas that are environmentally sensitive, uh, you know, fragment forests, damaged wetlands, or otherwise you know, create sprawl. I mean, that's what I understand the purpose of marrying these two bills together is to do both at the same time, to develop where we want to develop, and make it harder to develop in areas that would be problematic. Some of the conditions within 687 would really adversely impact some of the rural areas of the state that need housing too. So it might help Burlington, it might help some of the bigger communities, but it would do little, uh, from my understanding, to help some of the rural communities that again, need our help and they need housing um, they need to be, uh, they need a revival as well. So um, those are some, just a couple of the things that, uh, that are problematic from our standpoint. I think Julie had uh, talked about some of the other ones uh, earlier in this conversation, um, but maybe Julie would like to weigh in as well. I'd be happy to, Governor. And I, and I, I think it is, um, that, that we're not meeting the, the, the moment we're in, that, that the additional environmental protections that are contemplated by 687 take a medium and long-term view, in part because we have a, a whole series of, of new definitions that need work and contemplation and evaluation. Um, and while we're in the moment of, of doing that work, uh, we need housing right now. And the balance isn't there between those two. Uh, in addition, as I, I noted earlier in the, the press conference, uh, 687, whether intentionally or, or simply by virtue of people losing track of the components of its more than 200 pages, creates real and immediate complications around appeals, around deference being granted to the agency and our current regulatory that the um, and is going to add time and confusion to the process in the near term, even as it see, seeks to provide uh, additional regulatory requirements in the long term. Governor, may I add to that? And, and Kevin, I think, just to clarify, we, we in concept, agree with the idea of this location-based jurisdiction where you have exemptions in certain areas, focus development there. Um, the complication here is that tier, tier one has certain requirements, especially tier 1A has requirements that even the Burlingtons and the Winooskis, the, the big uh, communities, they'd even have a hard time reaching some of the standards that are set forth, such as wildlife uh, protection um, bylaws and other things that go above and beyond what was ever in a compromise. And so uh, it goes beyond restrictive for allowing that type of development. So. I think Secretary Moore said it best that that balance just isn't quite there. There are tweaks we can make, and we're ready to offer those those changes as Secretary Curley did last night, but it's just not there yet. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much. I have a, a different question on a different bill, Governor, if that's okay. Sure. So H72, this is the bill that would uh, allow overdose prevention sites in the state, which you've expressed opposition to. Has that been modified, or is in the process, I would gather, of being modified to um, uh, only provide funding for a single site? Everyone presumes that single site would be in Burlington, and I believe even your health commissioner has said that he's 
not terribly opposed to the idea of a single pilot site in the city of Burlington. And given that there's a mayor, new mayor in Burlington has expressed support for this, and there seems to be support in Burlington, where does your opposition to that bill stand if it's just for a single site for Burlington? Yeah, my, my position hasn't changed uh, at all, Kevin. I'm still opposed to it uh, from a financial aspect and philosophical aspect as well. Got it. Thank you. And Newport Daily Express. Good, good afternoon. Can you hear me? You can. Okay. Uh, Governor, I'm going to stay on the education subject. Uh, the, the last time I uh, asked you a question was about whether you would consider um, statewide teacher contracts and um, also for support staff. My question today is with the uh, new secretary of uh, the agency and education on board, is there any consideration to consolidating supervisory unit districts and make them more broadly regional as a way of cutting back some of the uh, administration and some of the uh, overlapping functions? Um, I would say basically yes. I, I believe that. Uh, I believe this for quite some time, uh, that we should be uh, thinking about the uh, structural problems we have and not just the educational f uh, financing, uh, but, uh, but as well as in the structure itself. And uh, it seems as though we are top heavy in some of the supervisor, superintendents, the number we have in the state compared to the population. Um, that number doesn't, hasn't decreased uh, uh, dramatically over the last uh, couple of decades, it, we did at one point reduce it, but, uh, but not far enough. So I think we talked to some of the, the education leaders in other states and, and they have one district uh, that would, has more student population than we have uh, throughout the whole state. So I think, again, I think it all should be on the table and we should consider any way we can uh, to uh, to lower the cost, um, but uh, and, and put put the money, any savings possibly towards the, the student themselves, um, so that we deliver a better education for them uh, without using it up in overhead. Is there going to be? Um, is there still going to be a need for the uh, state board of education? Do they fit into the future? I think there has to be uh, some sort of entity. Um, so I would, I would say in some form, sure. Thank you very much, Governor. Have a good day. You too. Keith Rutland Harold. Uh, hi. So the Rutland Town Select Board met last week, and one of the things they were talking about was uh, a rumor they had heard. They acknowledged it was a rumor, but they seemed uh, fairly concerned about the idea anyway. Um, they seemed to be, somehow they got wind that the state was looking at the Cortina Inn and maybe possibly some other inns to um, lease or maybe purchase. I don't purchase, but lease seemed like it might be reasonable. Um, you basically get control of that building um, to use it as some kind of uh, homeless shelter type of thing. Um, they were very concerned about this to the point where I think they were going to invite someone from AHS to uh, come talk to them about it. I was wondering if um, you knew what might be going on there, what they were hearing, what the actual fact of the matter is? I, I don't know, uh, have any of those details at this point in time, Keith, but i um, be happy to get somebody from AHS or uh, DCF to, uh, to contact you directly. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Tom Davis, Thomas Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, um, the Affordable Heat Act, uh, S-5, <laughs> is set to go into action in January 2025, subject to a one more legislative vote. Um, some fuel and propane suppliers around Vermont have been issuing letters to their customers to warn them of uh, the, uh, the incoming uh, service charge that they will be seeing and they're estimating it's gonna be around 70 cents per gallon of propane and or fuel oil. Um, 
And I want to know if those since those letters have come out, have you seen any reaction from that from the public? And also, do you have a sense whether or not the legislature is going to stick to its guns and go ahead and implement this in 2025? Well, as you know, Tom, I, um, I vetoed that bill and was overridden. But, uh, but the 70 cents doesn't surprise me. Um, maybe it might even be a little light. I don't know. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens when they get through their process and it comes before the legislature and the next session. Uh, so uh, I have no idea whether they'll move forward with it or not. I think um, it'll all depend on, on you know, the realities and what, um, what the impact will be. But again, this is all predictable. It's something that we've been talking about for quite some time. When we see this, uh, this cliff that we're facing with, uh, with the education fund, that was predictable. Something we talked about since the fir my first day in office and that offered solutions to that. Um, we, have a, we have a payroll tax that's uh, being, uh, going into place in, in July. Um, we have 20% increase in DMV fees. We have all kinds of taxes being proposed by the legislature at this point in time. Um, it's, it all adds up. It's, uh, it's like this drip, 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 and it's increasing the cost of living in Vermont and forcing people to make decisions about where they live. And it's not just the affluent. It's, uh, it's, I'm more concerned about those who, um, who are struggling, struggling now. And this is just, this, we're not moving in the right direction. Affordability is an issue that all of us face. And I think it's something that some seem to forget when they get in here. And the natural reaction to the legislature to any problem, a knee-jerk reaction is, let's just raise another tax and fix it. Well, sometimes it's, it's, that's the easy way. Uh, the, the more difficult way is to look at the structural problems we have and fix them. And uh, it's something you have to do in business every single day. And I think that we, um, we're a little void of that here uh, in this, uh, this body. With, the, with all those different increases in those costs, uh, the fees and the taxes, um, has the feedback into your office increased from Vermonters? I don't know if it's increased, uh, but, um, but there has been a steady, steady, um, I think, there, people are scared, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, they just don't know what they're going to do because they don't know where to go. And they know these, these fees and, and taxes are coming right down on them. Um, some of them last year, some of the taxes that were, were imposed were regressive. You know, they talk about taxing the rich, rich and last year they, they taxed the poor as well. So I, I, they're just scared and um, we'll just have to do all we can to prevent it from happening. No other questions, thank you, sir. Governor, we have tens of millions, really, I guess hundreds of millions, committed in telecom and emergency communications planning. Uh, are you satisfied with the planning and oversight of this process? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I know that, that like with any planning, nothing's perfect, um, but, um, but we're moving forward in a measured way, uh, not at the speed I'd like to see, um, but, um, but not everyone thinks uh, the way I do. I wanted to, to make sure that we had a dispatching uh, that was universal, uh, that could be utilized by, by everyone throughout Vermont. Um, and, um, but I've wanted that for over a decade. And, uh, and through different administrations, that hasn't happened. So it all comes down to who's, who's paying in, who's not, and who's supportive, who, who needs it, who doesn't. And uh, it's just not, uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult um, concept to, uh, to move across the finish line. It's complicated. Governor, back to education. Um, do you have any concerns <clears throat> about Zoe Saunders' uh, confirmation? I know some folks have expressed concern about the background in charter schools. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the more that Zoe gets out and meets all of you 
And uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to interview her, I would offer that uh, you should call us and or call her and set it up because the more you get to know her, you, you will see the strength she has, why she was our top pick, and, uh, and the benefit she will bring to Vermont if she is uh, confirmed. So I think the more you get to know her, the better you like her. I had a follow-up to what Kevin was asking about um, drug policy. As you know, overdoses are still incredibly high. We don't have year-end data from last year, but um, potentially setting new records. Oregon recently rolled back Measure 110, which was the decriminalization of, of all drugs to get people into treatment. They rolled that back recently. There's still a bill kicking around here in the State House, which would decriminalize personal amounts of, of drugs. I mean, for, for you, is, is, is there, I know you've been opposed, but is there a learning lesson here or something that Vermont can glean from Oregon? Well, I think, you know, we can always learn from other states. And uh, if Oregon rolled theirs back, there was a reason for it. I, that's why I'm opposed to the uh, safe injection sites. I think more money should be put into treatment. We know that works, and, uh, and we've seen elevated uh, overdose deaths, unfortunately. Um, but I, I attribute that to fentanyl uh, and xylazine and, uh, and what it's uh, being, other drugs being laced with it. So uh, highly addictive and, and very deadly. So we're doing all we can in that respect, and some of that comes on the public safety uh, sector as well. And uh, so that's why we've been trying to do everything from all different approaches uh, to lower the risk. But treatment, treatment is something that we, we, we can't let our foot off the gas on this one um, because we need to get them in treatment uh, when they're ready and, and get them on a better path. Is our public school model able to keep up with, with fentanyl and xylazine? You mentioned these are really potentially I mean, lethal drugs yeah. in some cases. I mean, how, how, do you, uh, how do you crack that nut? Yeah, some of it, you know, of course, they have to be ready uh, for treatment uh, as well, those uh, who are addicted. So that's always a challenge. And but we feel if we, you know, we want to broaden the hub and spoke pro program, and uh, find any efficiencies we can there and make it as user-friendly as possible to get those who are affected uh, into treatment and then into recovery. Can we go back to the, the Friday proposal from Commissioner Folio? So to be clear, does your administration have any plan B if legislators don't go for the Folio plan at least on Friday? Well, my, I don't know what the plan B would be. If they're not willing to do anything right now, then they're part of the problem. They're accepting this 20% increase, which I'm not accepting. So all I can do is have my one vote. Right, but do you have a, an alternative plan for something that they could do instead of? I mean, you're saying that they're not willing to do anything, but do you have well, how, how can I get them to do something when they're unwilling to do it? I mean, you can throw out other options. If well, what's wrong with the option that we put out there? The treasurer of that they need to about the rating. Well, then they ought to get creative and figure a way to make it work without affecting our bond rating. Okay. They're smart so people. What? They're smart people. You're smart, too. So what about a, a proposal from you? Uh, look, again, I want to t tone this down a bit because I think there's a creative approach to this. We just have to think it through. And I, I don't accept uh, this, uh, that we can't do anything. I just won't accept that. I don't think Vermonters expect us to do that either. They, they're counting on us to fix this. So we need to fix it. And if we have to implement something that's uncomfortable, then, then let's do it. What is it? What is it going? To, what is it going to cost us? How much is it going to cost us? I don't know. Well, I don't know either. So I think we should we should have that information before we shove that aside. Shouldn't we have that information before we put this plan in place, though? Sure. Do you think that 
Do you think that if, if you move forward or if the legislature moves forward with a plan that potentially raises or downgrades our credit rating, and then Vermonters pay for that in the long term if our borrowing rates are increased, isn't that just shoving the cost burden down to future Vermonters, it really future legislature, or future governor? It depends on how much it is, right? And this is an if they downgrade. They don't always downgrade um, because of some approach we've taken. I think the treasurer would agree if we had cost measures in place and a plan, a real plan to lower costs, then I'm not sure that they would downgrade. I think they would take that as a solid plan that you, you understand where we are, we're at. If we don't do anything, it's going to keep increasing. And so when, we, when it starts affecting the economy, I think those same bond agencies, the rating agencies, would have a problem seeing our whole economy start to erode because we're taxing too much. They worry about those kinds of things too.